Welcome to Wednesdays with Willa. I am your host, Willa White, and this is my weekly podcast show that airs on Wednesday mornings at 10 a.m. Eastern on my Facebook page, Willa White Medium. It's an opportunity for us to have a wonderful spiritual discussion. I typically have a special guest on the show, and we cover a topic relating to either spiritualism, mediumship, healing, faith, family, or more. And today, as my special guest, I have with me Tom Kratzley. Thanks for being on the show today, Tom. Well, thanks for having me. <laughs> Tom is an incredible spiritual healer, and he's an associate director of the Fellowships of the Spirit. So he does teaching of uh, healing uh, and has for many years been a resident of Lilydale. Tom's been on my show before, and we've uh, talked about wonderful healing topics and about Andrew Jackson Davis. And we're definitely going to do a deep dive into that today. Our topic today is the super consciousness pathway. And it's about uh, Andrew Jackson Davis and the superior condition. And Tom is going to share with us some ways of entering into super consciousness, as well as a wonderful meditation. So stay tuned till the end, because the meditation is a little bit later on, after uh, he's been able to share some wonderful background about how to enter into that super consciousness. I encourage you to look at the archive videos of past shows on my Facebook page, Willa White Medium. You, should, you can also uh, take a look at things on YouTube, my YouTube channel. And this uh, uh, streams out on blogtalkradio.com slash Radio. And if while you're looking at the archive videos of the show, I know a lot of people like to binge watch Wednesdays with Willa shows because this is in year five. Uh, Tom has been a guest on the show. We've talked about Andrew Jackson Davis two times before. So all you have to do is type in there, Tom Gradsley or tip, type in Andrew Jackson Davis, and you can get some more information about this amazing, amazing man. So Tom, we're going to enter into this wonderful super consciousness state today. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I think it it it, um, it bears well to first talk about D Davis and mm -hmm. his philosophy and how he got to the point that he was able to do what he did, and that is to be in that superconscious state, a truly super superior condition, um, unlike almost anyone in human history. By the way, I mean it, it, the level at which he was able to maintain that clear perception uh, of, of the vast reality of, of, of nature and existence is truly astounding. Uh, and, and to do so in a way that was, um, that, 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 that is very um, um, kind of three-dimensional, if you will. It, it wasn't airy-fairy, you know? Like he could do things like perceive um, the interior of the planet, or perceive, if you will, the um, uh, the atmospheres of all the planets in the solar system, and we know that he did that well from space probes a hundred years later. You know, so so th that's what I'm talking about. That level of perception is truly extraordinary. Now, I'm not saying everybody can get there, um, uh, uh, and what you know, he even called it the century flower. You know, to be able to 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 have that that level of ability, but at the same time, he also said that everyone has the capability if they employ themselves in the right way. So here's a, a little background about him, and and I think it helps if if you understand his background, why he was able to do what he was able to do, um, given his teaching later about it. So. Basically, he was born dirt poor, um, and this is in 1826. And um, in in uh, uh, an area around Poughkeepsie, New York, all right. And his family had to move many times, always to a worse situation. You know, his father was an alcoholic. His mother had some spiritual, uh, um, uh, traditional spiritual bent to her, but you know, as he said, you know, it was. Um, um, there, there was a lot of superstition associated with it. So the one thing that he had, and, and by the way, no education, almost no, like three months of formal education, could barely read or write. The one thing he had was an indomitable curiosity. 
constantly, you know, asking himself, because you could see this in his autobiography, always looking at why this, why that, what, you know, what, you know, the questions about the nature of everything that he experienced. And when he was um, uh, about 18, 17, 18 years old, he became interested in mesmerism, which at the time was popular in North America. And there were, were those practitioners of mesmerism. Now at the time, it's understandable, we think of mesmerism as, as hypnosis, right? In those days, it was not thought of as hypnosis. It was a healing technique, right? And the way it was practiced was the operator, as they were called, would do hand passes around the subject for as, as long as 45 minutes at a time. And people would often experience significant healing from that. On occasion, however, there were those people that while they were um, uh, being given a treatment would go into a trance state and they would exhibit unusual um, perceptual characteristics, things like they were able to see things in, um, at a distance, et cetera, et cetera. Well, after about the third time Davis um, on, under the mesmeric um, um, operator went into a trance state and it was discovered that he could do medical clairvoyance, which means that he would di could diagnose with um, proper medical terminology and prescribe cures for people and was very successful at, at, at being able to do that. So even his operator decided to quit his job <laughs> and the two of them, you know, w went and did this on a daily basis for, um, um, for about three years. And somewhere in the midst of that, uh, probably about a year and a half into it, a year, year and a half into it, um, under trance, they were, um, they were given the suggestion they needed to assemble a group of people in New York City, um, intelligent, you know, um, <clears throat> educated people for a series of lectures, trance lectures to be delivered. And those lectures were eventually um, compiled into a book called Nature's Divine Revelation, A Message to Mankind, which was a way of integrating all of the newfound science that was, you know, uh, all kinds of discoveries happening in the middle part of the 19th century. Tremendous awakening, you know, scientifically. But it was merging that with, um, um, with spirituality in a way that had never been done before. And by the way, it's only starting to be done now, you know, um, amongst the, the, uh, um, the scientific community. It, it's only starting to be done in, with, with the scientific community, you know, and I give people great credit for that. People like Greg, Greg Braden and, um, uh, and others, by the way, um, Jordan Peterson is working in that area. So these people are doing, a, you know, a wonderful job in doing that. But Davis did it all back in 1847. It was, it's clearly spelled out in nature's divine revelation message to mankind in you know, in amazing ways. So the reason that I, 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 I present that um, as, as a backdrop is because he describes um, the development of perception in, in the third volume of the Harmonial Philosophy, um, subtitled The Seven Mental States. Now, the seven, it's not, it's, it's not a progression of one state to another. another it's not, it, it doesn't, it's not, um, you start at one state and you, do, you go to the next state, you know. No, they're, all these states are kind of intertwined in, 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 in so some glad fashion. I'm mention that because usually we think of things in a vertical. Yes, it's, yeah. Idea, a construct. And this is everything. It's very, that, yeah. Um, just like the, the way the aura is, you know, the aura layers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's, all, it, it, yeah. Absolutely. I'm glad you mentioned that. Well, yeah, it's much more like that. It's mm -hmm. not, um, it's not progressive, let's say, you know, progress, you know, but they all part of it. There is, a, there is an aspect of the progression that has to do with the individual and the individual learning and understanding how these states work with each other. Mm -hmm. And that's the importance of it. It's like how, how we understand how, how um, let's say, for instance, let me, I'll, I'll give you the list of the states. 
fascinating. It starts with a it starts with a rudimentary state, mm -hmm. and that's almost like the um, you know um, uh, the base person without um, without the influence of culture, without the influence of all this. You know what I'm saying? And the rudimental state is actually a can be a pretty good one. Um, it's like the rudiment, like animal uh, animal consciousness. They just do what they need to do. And they're engaged with their environment in a way that has to, you know, in a way that functions. So, and then, then comes the psychological state. And here's where the difficulty begins to um, um, be created for us as human beings. Because in the psychological state, we, um, we, we take on the, um, um, the beliefs, the habits, the, the patterns of society and others you um, know, in, in a way that um, that inhibits our own individual, often curiosity, mm -hmm. and our own individual opportunity to perceive things freshly. Right? Um, he gives some wonderful examples of how that um, it, it's also powerful in many ways. It all you know it can can in, so in draw a group us into consciousness, a, a tribal understanding. You know, yes. being part of a tribe or working as a team is important. Yes. And so here's here's an example of, of him giving a, um, a, a client of his a clear perception of, of his melody, what was going on with him, mm -hmm. and his client's inability to, to hold that in his awareness because of preconceived notions. All right. So he says, on one occasion, I was visited by a very respectable clergyman of New York who said the devil tempted him at least once every week to commit suicide. This was proof to his mind that there was in reality a living demon who exerted himself energetically to destroy both soul and body in hell. I inquired if he was not diseased. He answered that his health was perfectly good, but he desired me to make an interior inspection of his condition. I did so and incidentally discovered that his suicidal temptation originated from the psychological influence of his mother's spirit upon his mind before birth. Of this, I immediately informed him. Oh, yes, he said, uh, said, uh, said he. My mother has often told me that the devil tempted her the same manner, um, but I was soon enabled to inform him that his mother's mind was agitated by a disease of the liver and diaphragm, which invariably produces mental depression and sadness under certain conditions. And a tendency to suicide was a common feeling to minds thus affected, especially when associated with small hope and feeble resolution. Um, this explanation was rather too rational and unsupernatural for the clergyman, and it overthrew a strong evidence of the devil's existence. So he didn't believe a word of it. Oh, okay. So that's the power. That it's, and so he also uh, he gives a, a story that illustrates the depth of, of, of those kinds of influences, the psychological influences. Many years ago in France, a criminal was to be publicly executed upon the wheel. And a mother whose child was yet unborn desired to be present. Notwithstanding the strong entreaties of her husband and physicians to the contrary, she yielded to her impulse to witness the execution. The terrible scene completely psychologized her. She stood transfixed. She heard the bones of the poor criminal snap and break on the wheel like dry sticks in a strong man's hand. Oh, it was too horrid, and she sank exhausted and swooned upon the ground. Ninety days from that time, her child was born with every bone of its little body broken and separated in a corresponding manner. Oh, goodness. I don't know that I wanted you to share that story with me. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, and that's the power of, of, you know, today we talk about the unconscious mind, right? In a way, it's, it's it, it, you know, he, he didn't use terms like that because they weren't, they weren't popular, but he knew that the, that the psychology affected people in this way and they would be, they, they, they're stuck into perceptual modes. Mm -hmm because of the belief patterns, right. you know, and, and because of their history. And, and that's what he says, that, you know, the, that one of the most important keys 
to develop one's um, um, perceptual abilities and to it is to make sure that we examine these things and um, and honor our own truth about it and say, look, this doesn't make any sense. I can let it go. Mm -hmm. But it's it important the, for every person to do. It was one of the reasons why like, the Jesus story is so incredible because people would move into a state of belief and therefore be healed, right? And then right. they also have that understanding, you know, even with Buddha, you know, that, um, that understanding of when you switch into, but remember one of the things that happens when you say the Jesus story, right? Mm -hmm. He would say, I'll say, go and sin no more. But what does he mean by that? Right. What he meant by that is don't make the same mistakes. It's like, so there are errors in perception and judgment yeah. and, um, and action sometimes. If and you stop pattern. that, if mm -hmm. you stop that, the healing naturally happens. Mm -hmm. um, Jesus interrupted that and says, okay, now... You know, you know, with the, with the, with the truth, yes. and people were then able to say, "Oh, oh that's what it was." Okay. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I should mention, uh, Tom has been on the show, and he's talked about restructuring before, which is a, a specialized uh, spiritual healing that you do as well to help people move. Yeah, it's it's it's, it's yeah, it's a way of of identifying what holds us back and then releasing it in the moment. See, I think our reality is very often um defined contextually, right? Mm -hmm. As human beings. You know, we have we learn um we learn contextually, you know, our, even our religious beliefs and all these other, you know, and and what I mean by contextually you, you know, we, you enjoy um, as a child um, the experience of sometimes going to church. Sometimes you don't enjoy it. <laughs> but those contexts have meaning for each and every one of us. Now, if it's intense or if it's in, intensely good or negative, um, it sits deeply in your, um, in your unconscious mind and helps direct your perceptions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? And, yes. and so it's important for every one of us to know the underpinnings of our um, of, of our beliefs and to and, and to look at them and say, does this make any sense anymore? Does this in light of the fact that, you know, let me let's go from the psychological state into the sympathetic state now, because the sympathetic state is a beautiful state. And this is the state where we, we, we experience rapport with nature. Mm -hmm. and, and, and like you said, the healthy mind, the healthy mind experiences the awe, experiences the sense of um, the divinity unfolding itself in physical reality through nature. You know that everything in in, in nature that it, with the with the proper eye um, emanates light, emanates truth. It does. Yeah. You know? And I think you know most people recognize this if 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 they even take a moment to look at their lives and say there are times for for almost everyone when we're out in nature and something magical happens. You know. I think it'd be very hard to find a person that hasn't had that. <laughs> it's one of my favorite states to be in. Yeah. <laughs> and Lilydale right. gives yeah, people course. that opportunity. I think as soon as they come in the gates and you know we, we have nature here, they start to open in those ways. I think it does help the, to get them into that particular condition. Yeah, and it's very important to our tradition. Exactly. Nature's divine revelation. Yeah. You know, it's there constantly all the time. Um, for us, you know, for the mindset. So what happens though is that, you know, um, and, and Davis talks about this too. It's like, it, it's, it, it's um, more eloquently than I can, but it takes more time and I don't want to you know, take too much because we got a lot more to cover. Sure we do. Andrew Jackson <laughs> Davis wrote a lot of books. 
<laughs> right. But all of this is just in the one book that I'm talking yeah. about, you know, more eloquently. It, it's, it's absolutely, um, you know, I'm, I, I get transfixed by reading them, you know, uh, to me, it's almost like I get into a sympathetic state just reading Davis at times. But so anyway, you know, he talks about how, um, you know, in the in, in the stresses of daily life, you know, people cloud their perception and don't allow themselves to take that in, you know, um, but it's there all the time, regardless. Uh, and so that's what he now the transitional state. Let's talk a little bit about that. The transitional state is very interesting because um, this is a state where people do get, you know, allow themselves to be inspired. Um, and that ins inspiration then is, um, is tainted with belief. <laughs> so there is, you know, genuine inspiration, but then it's, it's tainted by, you know, a specific religious tradition, et cetera, et cetera, that, that, that um, people hold fast to what was taught them as, you know, the absolute in their religious tradition. And so that they're being inspired and it doesn't get through with, um, um, with the innocence it needs to get through, let's say. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. You know, without being saying, and and what he says is that all the um, all the religious chieftains of old, you know, you know, were in that state, <laughs> you know, in the transitional state. Um, he done now. What's interesting about him, and, and when he talks about it, is he is not demeaning them. He's not putting them down. He says, you know, this is part of the evolution of of mind and understanding. Right. So he's not saying, you know, the you know. The, everything they said was garbage. He's not saying, saying it was useful for the time and the situation. And, and these the are necessary around. parts of a, of a person, as we, yeah. as we mentioned before, yeah. you know, we're on um, the fourth one, right? And yeah. the, that understanding of they all nestle together. Yes. As a complete human being. Yes, yes, yeah. And oh, even to the point where, you know, um, one of his guides um, was Emanuel Swedenborg. Yes. Yeah. Now, and, and he put Swedenborg in that category. <laughs> well, I can understand that to some extent. I, I, do, I do understand that to some extent. And so for those of you who don't know who Emanuel Swedenborg is, he was an amazing Swedish scientist and he was well documented as helping people throughout Europe come up with understandings and he he helped uh, in that true scientific world and then he stepped into the spiritual understanding and that's what he went into exploration with right and, and he, he was, was 56 at the time he was 56 at the time and he wrote a book on almost every book of the bible giving its metaphysical interpretation now Here's the, the area where Davis, you know, disagreed with uh, um, him and uh, that, that he was some kind of a unique um, representative of the divine. Okay, so that, you know, th that that was a, but he's saying, no, he's not unique. It's just that it, it, that was his, uh, his, his ability to, to bring this through that other people can, uh, can access it as well. That's what he's saying. Um, it's 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 not that you know it was just there only there for him to bring bring about, but the truth is always there for anyone to discover. <laughs> yes, it, you know, it's one of the things when I read the history of spiritualism, I go, "Wow, we can do this too." Yes, when you, when you look at the different mediums and different things yeah. that have gone before, those are meant to also be inspiring to us, so that yeah. we know that that's all accessible. No. So, okay, so that's the transitional state. Now that we talk about the clairvoyant state. Now the clairvoyant state is, you know, certainly early on in his, uh, where that, well, he was under mesmeric conditions. He was put into the clairvoyant state where we're seeing things he wouldn't ordinarily be able to see and so on. Um, and, um, um, and that's very similar to what uh, in modern day spiritualism, we talk about the difference between mediumship and psychism, right? So there's the clairvoyant state and the mediumship is then sort of transitional to, to the spiritual state, but not all there, 
right? It's 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 like there is the um, there that it's sort of like a half step up where you're able to uh, then communicate well with spiritual beings. Yes. You know, yes. Whether they be whether they be loved ones who passed on, teachers, angels, um, uh, masters uh, of a higher realm, etc. So that's very fascinating, and and so to me, that's the area that we're, we we tend to play in um, as as spirituals, and most most humans who are on the upward swing spiritually. <laughs> Are yeah, in I, that, I would so, say definitely Swedenborg should be in that category. Oh, Swedenborg would have, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, well, yes. Again, what we're saying is that these are, they're existing simultaneously. Right? Sure. But I, I feel like he got there. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and many others did. And even he talks about the prophets in the Bible who were yeah. able to do that. So that was one of their, you know, the transitional and, and, and clairvoyant could certainly, are certainly blending, you know. And and those people should have been able to experience as well the sympathetic state. Yeah. Right? So, that, you know, that, that, as we started out at the beginning, it's like these things aren't, you know, divorced from each other. Right. Uh, so, um, <clears throat> so then, so, so, but anyway, this is the, this is the area, and this is why I think that we, we waste a lot of time as spiritualists arguing whether or not you know, something is psychic or, you know, or, or, or mediumistic, et cetera. It's like, look, does it bring forth truth? Does it bring forth, you know, healing? Does it bring forth? Those are the Im most important uh, elements here. You know, not, you know, not whether you can label where it's coming from or, or what the, or, what the zone is. Mm -hmm. And fundamentally, you know, as far as Davis is concerned, that's the um, that's the most important um, lesson is um, your commitment to your own goodness. Yes. That's it, you know. Beyond the, so, like if you're committed to being the best person you can be, then you can move up this. You know, then you can begin to integrate all of this, and it's. Ultimately, what we're talking about is the integrated human being, not the fractured human being. So all of these things are, you know, the, like the things that take us from perceiving the um, the world in with clarity are our internal conflicts. Mm -hmm. So th those are the things that leave us as fractured human beings. Is as we identify them and let them go. All of this stuff comes in. You know, one of the things I asked myself a question, and, and, and it took me a long time to answer it, because I looked at uh, Davis and I looked at um, some of the people and, and the mystics and from, from traditions past um, that I had great regard for. And I'd say, what, what really makes them different? How, what is it? Um, Jesus, another one, you know, from the time I was, I was a kid, I, I like Jesus. I didn't care much for Christianity as time went by. <laughs> um, but I love Jesus. And, um, yeah. and most people have that, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, and so and I give it to you. So what I what it comes down to, and Davis even talks about this, but in different terminologies, to me is moral courage. Mm. Mm moral courage and our commitment to being the best person we can be. Um, and as we, as, as we maintain that regardless of the circumstances around us, you know, and the, um, um, the challenges we face, et cetera, et cetera. When I look at their lives, they all had a profound, truly profound measure of moral courage. Mm -hmm stand up against you know things that weren't true to them you know or not against stand up for the truth regardless of of of, of what the challenges were or what possible human consequences there would be yeah yep and um and so davis did that as like for it you know it, was, it all boils down to if we look go back and look at the the one thing that um um, spiritualist Lyceum students are taught about Davis, and the one thing everybody remembers: 
under all circumstances, keep an even mind. That was his magic staff. And it's important to know a little bit about this because um, if you read it in his autobiography, you get a good sense that when this came to him, he was in a, um, he was facing personal challenges at the time. He was in a, um, a, a, in a difficult place. And um, uh, his guidance came to him and said, uh, and showed him the letters and blazons, you know, in light um, before him, you know, under all circumstances, keep an even mind. And then it followed up with, this is your staff, lean on it, depend on it. It's like, but what you get from reading it from his autobiography, that it wasn't just like reading a line in a book. It was something that impregnated his consciousness, right? This is much more profound than reading something. <laughs> it's, it's, like, it's something that becomes embedded. Exactly. He knew it at the he yeah. knew it at the very core of his being, the truth of it, and could then live it. And then it's very clear, you know, from the reports of people who knew him, you know, about him, that that's the way he was for the rest of his life. He wasn't um, overly excited by the positive things, nor was he taken down by the negative stuff in his, in his life. So, so, you know, it, it, to me, when we start to look at those, those pieces and how those are what make, what makes um, the, the greatest special, their ability to stay um, um, committed to the good, yeah, to the good, to the truth, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and so, so anyway, so, so that's where we move into the superior condition. And in the superior condition, that's the place where you have opportunity or access to literally all knowledge. An example of that. Is in his, there's one example in his autobiography. Um, this, there is actually a number of them. Oh, let me, I wanna read this because this tells you a little bit about that moral courage, all right? Uh, and this is from his autobiography. He says, prejudice is impudent as idiotic and merciless as erroneous. Of this, my private history is a demonstration. Minds too blunted to feel the truth, too indolent to examine a principle, are the first to cry mad dog and shout infidel. Hoots, hisses, and silly exclamations reach my outer ear almost every day. Sunday school boys would chalk vulgar words upon our cottage fence and gate posts. Students of Cicero, Xenophon, Locke, Bacon, and Divinity would echo in public the ridicule which salary professors oftentimes whispered in private. And young ladies too not overstocked with the charity that thinketh no evil, but imbibing in the prejudice of preceptress, minister, or parents, all equally misinformed, would nervously ejaculate cunning little epithets and harmless satires with which they sought to check the progress of our movement. What was all this to me? Amusement and nothing more. In the blue sky, I had friends stable as the everlasting mountains. That's an example of moral courage. <laughs> right. Now, this is an example of the superior condition. So he's on a um, he's on a train between Cleveland and uh, and Buffalo. He says, while in the cars between Buffalo and Cleveland, an elegantly dressed but shabbily minded individual recognized me, advanced and asked, "Can you tell how the sun looks aside our, our atmosphere?" I have never personally written, risen beyond our atmosphere, I replied, yet by impression and clairvoyance, I have viewed the sun from space and can therefore tell you how it appears. Taking a cigar from his mouth and pu puffing a column of fetid vapor into the air I was breathing, he said, <laughs> I'm posted in astronomy, sir, and can tell you um, whether you're right pretty darn quick if you answer my questions. Well said I, smiling in a momentary emotion of the ludicrous, what are your questions? If you know how our sun looks from a distance, he replied pompously, tell me. From the earth's surface, said I good naturedly, the heavens appear filled with light, as you know, by observation. But should you ascend to the outer rim of our atmosphere 
and look toward the sun, you would see a rayless ball of fire steadfastly burning in a universe of night. The sun would present no atmosphere, the countless stars would emit no scintillations, and the now azure sky would seem like a black concave immeasurable. Fudge, he exclaimed, that's all spiritual twaddle, sir, all damn nonsense. What reason can you give for what you've been saying? The reasons are very simple, said I quietly. Light is equalized on the earth by the operation of two causes. First, the perfect absorption and refraction of the sun's rays by our atmosphere. Second, the reflection of light thus diffused by bodies on the earth's surface. The questioner seemed a little less irritable now. It's important to remember this is 1850. Okay. Right. 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 Some say the air is cold in space. Is that so? Yes, sir, said I. The temperature at a distance of 45 miles from the globe is lower than any cold known to men. You mean to say that it's colder up there than at the North Pole? Yes, sir, I answered. The intense cold in the regions of eternal snow is almost warm weather when compared with the upper air. It has, look here now, said the man. Don't pile up the agony in that horrid way. You know, about this cold weather up there, aren't you confoundedly mistaken? <laughs> As he spoke, the superior condition flashed upon me, and instantly detecting more truth in regard to the cold, I replied, chemists can produce a lower temperature than that which prevails at the Arctic Circle. They can convert carbonic gas into solid substance, and quicksilver would become firm as iron. Yet this intensely freezing temperature, about 150 degrees below zero, is warmer by nearly 80 degrees than the cold of the upper realm. Very That's precise. Specific. It's very specific. Yes, very precise, very specific. And that's that superior condition kind of um For him uh, to throw perception. out numbers and facts like oh, yeah. that. And, yeah. and, you know, just to backtrack this a little bit in terms of Andrew Jackson's history, he was virtually illiterate. Yes. Right? When he first started doing any kind of trans work, he then, you know, did that, did that. And, and he was able taught to himself how to read and write, by the way. Right. Uh, but he, not only taught himself, but also with the aid of spirit, the, the of spiritual teachers <laughs> from the other realm would te help to uh, teach him how to read and write. Yeah. yeah. They, he, he went into, into that literate space. Yes. But yeah, I, he was able to channel um, those that could speak of a, on a higher level than he knew how to. And yes. I think he got used to knowing how to do that. And that maybe helped him initially move into the superior condition. Do you think that he would have been able to move into that as, I don't know if easily is the right word, but do you think he would have been able to move into that without that step of moving through the clairvoyance? Because as you said, there are these different levels or stages or states of being well i do think that it was very important that he 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 experienced that sense of um um knowledge beyond personal knowledge all right that mm -hmm. that came through that way uh, and um but even then so that he was able to do that but he was in a trance state during that remember he right. was sleeping and the big change for him was going from sleeping to awake, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? And that happened as a result of a, you know, of a personal epiphany. I mean, he was very disturbed um, during about the, about the, um, near the, nearing the end of the, of the lectures that produced Nature's Divine Revelation. He was very disturbed by the fact that all this stuff, all this great stuff was coming through Mm -hmm. And that he wasn't party to it, <laughs> sure. you know, consciously, right? Right. Because he and wanted to, point, he, his human self wanted to learn too. Right. So mm -hmm. at, it was at that point that he worked with his guides and teachers to be able to be conscious at the same time it was coming through. And once he moved to that step, he didn't need intermediaries. And that's something that is very special about spiritualism, the idea of you don't necessarily have to have an intermediary, that you and your own soul can have communion with your loved ones in spirit, with yeah. the divine, 
with the understanding of angels and with your 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 soul self well i think even more important i think it's obligation i think it's our it's our personal obligation to do that to move in that um uh, in that direction to to uh to claim our own um connection with the divine so yeah. so he went into the superior condition which is like the super consciousness right yeah. but in that in the essence of living there or maintaining that state it sounds like he he would go into it and as needed as needed you can go into as it needed. as needed just you're still living in three dimensional reality right mm -hmm. so i talk about you know one of the things that i've come to an awareness of i think that there are um two distinct types of knowing there's cold knowledge and warm knowledge right cold knowledge has to do with um the minutia of things in three dimension you know, like, oh, really discovering things under a microscope and you know, this, 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 all that, right? Warm knowledge comes from um, the understanding of everything connectedness, you know, the connectedness of everything and how, how that plays out. Now, love is a part of warm knowledge, right? Um, true love. I mean, talking about, you know, you know, it's like understanding, you know, on, on the real manifestation of love um, everywhere. That's that's warm wisdom and knowledge beyond all, you know, so that so so we're we're negotiating between the two here, between the warm knowledge and cold knowledge. Right now, it's a tremendous challenge on the um, um, to our and I think we're at a at a precipice, so to speak as a species, like, because, you know, what we, what we, we tend to be putting all of our eggs in is the basket of cold knowledge. And, uh, right? and in fact, you know, we, if we do that, we won't, um, we won't experience the fullness of our capacity as wise beings, because we have to have them both. You know, it, and people talk about right, left brain, it's kind of in that in that ballpark, but this is of a higher magnitude, you know. Um, and so, as um, and, and 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 this is why we we're experiencing, and many many people are experiencing the damaging effect of having been um, taken out of the uh, of the world of warm knowledge, which comes from us engaging with one another, Thank you know, you. expressing e expressing our. Um, our feelings, et cetera, et cetera. And all of that stuff comes um, through through that. It's like we have had two years of being um, um, deprived of that, Right. you know? So in terms of moving into super consciousness for, for the regular person to move mm -hmm. into that superior condition, uh, what do you feel is the pathway, the best pathway based on Andrew Jackson Davis's? Well, certainly, I, I, I think it's important for people to be to have a, a, some measure of commitment to their own growth and development. You know, uh, so so there there are several things that, in, involved here. That's that's number one, you know, to being the best, you know, and then out of that, then you have to start you have to set up some kind of plan for yourself. Well, how am I going to do this? You know, what's my what's what's my way of doing this? Um, and for many people, it's, you know, setting a meditation practice for themselves, which I think is very, um, 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 very beneficial for anybody. But the key here, though, is, is to finding a practice that's fit for you, you know, because I don't think there's one practice that benefits everybody. You know, we all, you know, there's, there, you know, we, we are unique flowers in, in, um, uh, in the tapestry of things, right? Yeah, so yeah. find something that works for you where you feel like as you're doing this meditation, something is becoming clearer for you internally. You know, it doesn't have to be, you know, um, you know all, um, you know, like fireworks going off every time you sit down and meditate. That doesn't work that way. But if you feel more centered, if you feel like, OK, this is taking me to a place that I need to be. And as that happens over time, 
you start to get um, more comfortable with your interior self. The more comfortable you are with your interior self, the more it opens you to, um, because your interior self, the truest part of it, is can never be divorced from the infinite. True. Right. So once you once once you move in that as you as you're moving in that direction, your um your entire consciousness, not just perception, everything unfolds in a more positive direction. Now that doesn't mean we're not facing challenges, <laughs> right? And so oftentimes help is, this is what helps us through those challenges, being able to do that. So that's those that's what I would say would, uh, would be. Um, uh, would be helpful. And then understanding, you know, like coming to an understanding, okay, um, how is today, how is today going to be different from yesterday? Just ask yourself that, you know, how can I make today, you know, a little bit better than yesterday um, for myself or for my family or for, you know, just in little ways, you know, so in every you little way you can. But there, you have the conviction, the the commitment to do to do better, to move into a state of intention, and also practice with this, and that it moves you from the rudimentary, the psychological, the sympathetic. Yes, you know, all those. Yeah. So, to, so for instance, yeah, in the sympathetic the, state. So as you do this more, when you go out in nature, you get more feedback. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and sometimes, you know, the, you, then you, one of the things I started doing was I meditate. I go, I, I go out of the Lake Erie and I stand in there up to my neck in water and I meditate. Mm. And I link with Mother Earth and I link with the waters of the world. Mm. Yeah. And, and, I, and I feel incredibly blessed. Incredibly blessed. Yeah. 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 It's, it's beautiful to connect with that earth and water yep. construction and know that it is it actually helps to propel you into that superior state too. Yeah. And when you enter into prayer, you're right there on the cusp of it. And so there's this understanding of there, here's your point A, here's your point B the little dots and the line in between. But then there's that the arrow that goes beyond point B. So would you say that the superior condition is point B or would you say it's beyond point B? Um, is that the final or is there anything beyond? Well, I don't think there's such a that? thing. I don't think there's such a thing as final. Because you the, the 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 infinite is immeasurable, so the, so that's the that's the tricky part to, to answering that question. There's no hierarchy once you're into superior condition. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, no hierarchy there. No, it's just that's what is. <laughs> that's what it is. That's but what you know, is. as as we begin, we talked about how these are all nestled together. And yes. so we can kind of move between them, hopefully not ping pong between them right. partially, but the idea of knowing that you're all, you're enmeshed in all of that. But it's recognized that these are facets of, um, they're all like facets, if you will, of the, of, of the perceptual um, um, organism that we have, you know, um, um, and when I say when I'm, I say that as organism because it's perceptual isn't just um, eyes and you know it's like it's spatial it's there's so many facets to our capacity for perception. Yes. Uh, yeah. Well, what other uh, tips or techniques would you want to share with with the folks today regarding entering into that super consciousness, really being on that super consciousness pathway? Well, it's they just that, that that capacity to let go, you know, just acknowledging that you can let go of things that stand in the way. Mm -hmm. But here's the key of letting go. And it's really, really important. You have to identify what the what the problem is. And then you can let it go. Mm -hmm. Most of the time we are stuck in places. And the reason we're stuck in places because we're confused. 
we're in states of confusion and we're not clear. And the way to get some measure of clarity is, um, is by sitting with yourself and going internal. It's like, what am I feeling right now? Especially when you're out of sorts. What's my predominant feeling here? You know, and try to, and, you know, spend some time with it. And it's like, as you begin to be able to articulate um, and you know when you can articulate because when you can identify it and say, I'm letting this go now. I don't want to hold on to this. You actually will feel some internal transformation taking place. Mm-hmm. Now, maybe it's temporary in the moment. That's okay. Right. You know, you may be peeling layers of an onion and that's okay too. But remember that, you know, like what it does is as you do that, it gives you confidence that, oh, I know myself a little better. I'm going to let go of this. I don't want this in my life anymore. I want, I want this, right? Mm-hmm. Bloody simple. <laughs> yes, yeah, right. So, but not yeah. easy, but not, not always easy. And I understand the fact that it's not easy. So once you have hit the superior condition, and know that you can achieve that. It's a bit more achievable after that. And to maintain that, that even mind, that superior condition has that understanding of the even mind and leading on that divine understanding that all will be well in the end. Because there's a positivity yes. associated with oh, the yes. superior condition and maintaining that Despite right. having someone smoke a guitar, uh, smoke a, a cigar in your face, and and interrogate you with questions that you can maintain. Well, equilibrium. I, mean, I, I do want to make one statement here, too, because I, I uh, fundamentally, it's it's actually impossible as a human being to maintain the superior condition. All right, because it's a level. Um, it, you know the. The infinite and the finite um, are coexistent, but you can't, um, it's like one or the other, right? It's, it's like, there, it's, we, in three-dimensional reality, we're, uh, um, we're a temporal and, um, um, let's say, um, uh, we're a reflection um, of a part of the infinite. As, a, as an individual, right? So when, when, when you link with the, the, the infinite understanding and the, the superior state, you're there for an answer, mm-hmm. right? Um, for an answer for um, a local reality. Infinite reality and local reality are two different places. Does that make sense? The way I oh, absolutely, it? and yeah. it's it's good to have that link with the infinite to help us with the finite living. That That's right. That's right. right. And it's, it's good to know that we have that access point by going into the superior condition. That that super consciousness is something that has always chosen us that we have to choose in a moment. That's right, right. And it's like, so let's get on to um, the- Yeah, let's I, I share mean, we have time. Um, Tom has get... a meditation to share with all of you to get into the super consciousness. Well, this is called domains of consciousness, right? Ooh. And it's based on, you know, a lot of, you know, one of the things that as I was exploring, um, um, understanding my own, uh, my own being and the way in which things have been taught, um, in the, um, at least in the 19th century in, in metaphysical traditions, we have these subtle bodies and so on. Um, what, what, what I felt, what I realized was that we're now in a new level of understanding. You know, we're in a quantum world, you know, and in the quantum world, we can understand ourselves as um, uh, a harmonious um, blending of levels of consciousness, you know, or expressions of consciousness, if you will, rather than levels. It, it, it's not a pejorative hierarchy. It is just 
you know, we're, we're all of these things um, working um, together harmoniously. So um, the domains, I tried to keep the domains as simple as possible and things that we could understand uh, um, ev almost every human being could understand. So we have a we exist as a physical body. There's a physical domain. We exist. Now this is the hardest one, but more people are coming to recognize this. You know, is the etheric or the vital domain, right? So that's love, vital life energy. You know, that's that that's that 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 domain. Um, the emotional domain. We all can agree to that. The mental domain. We mostly can all agree to that. The spiritual domain. And then I take it to, you know, what I would call, you know, like the superior state like, to me is the domain of unconditional love, mm. right? Now, every one of those has its own frequency range, right? And so what, um, what this meditation is designed to do is to help us focus on the frequency range and to experience that frequency range in our bodies, right? So we start out with the, um, the physical domain and experience it. Now, the metaphor I use for this is you think of your body as a variable pitched tuning fork that will give you the experience of whatever domain we choose as we work through. So I'm, I'll be guiding through this whole, whole thing, uh, you know, domain upon domain. Then when we get to the, um, the, the, the domain of unconditional love, we'll get to a point where we can become aware of love's desire to manifest its purity in and through us, right? And then we come back down and let ourselves become aware of love's desire to manifest its purity through our spiritual domain, through our mental domain, you know? So it, in a way, it's also a, a, a an internal healing um, experience, all right? That's beautiful. Okay, so that having been said, let's let's get down to it. We may be going a little bit over time. I, That's all right. I'm all sure right. people will appreciate it. <laughs> okay. All right. So here we go. So as we begin, just take a moment to um, focus on your breathing and allow it to become more effortless, more relaxed with each successive breath and feel your energy and awareness settling into your body. As it settles into your body, I want you to become aware of the frequency and, and, and vibration of the physical domain of consciousness. As you allow yourself to experience this rate, thinking of your body as this variable pitch tuning for. Become aware of your body, more aware of your body and the physical domain and your expression in this domain. Just allow your awareness to unfold as you've experienced the frequency. Still present in the body, shift the frequency you're experiencing now to that of the etheric domain. As you allow yourself to experience this rate of vibration, Observe your relationship to the vital etheric domain. Still present and centered in the body, shift the frequency you're experiencing now to that of the emotional domain of your consciousness. As you vibrate at this rate, this higher frequency, observe your relationship to the emotional domain. Still centered in the body, shift the frequency you're experiencing now to that of the mental domain of your consciousness. As you experience this rate of vibration, observe your relationship to the mental domain.
still set it in your body now. Shift the frequency you're experiencing to that of the spiritual domain. As you allow yourself to experience this higher rate of vibration, observe your expression in the spiritual domain. Just letting your awareness unfold. And still centered in the body, shift the frequency still higher now to that of the domain of unconditional love. As you allow yourself to experience this very high rate of vibration throughout your body, observe your relationship to this domain of pure love. And as you continue to experience this rate of vibration, become aware also of love's desire to manifest its purity in and through you. Just observe that with a sense of gratitude. It's still centered in the body now, shift the frequency once again to that of the spiritual domain. And as you experience this rate of vibration, once again, become aware also of love's desire to manifest its purity in and through your spiritual nature. Resonate to that purity, allowing it to reverberate and unfold throughout the spiritual domain of your consciousness. Shift the frequency to that of the mental domain. As you once again experience this rate of vibration, become aware of love's desire to manifest its purity in and through your mental nature. Resonate to that purity, allowing it to reverberate and unfold throughout the mental domain of your consciousness. Shift the frequency you're experiencing now to that of the emotional domain. As you once again experience this rate of vibration, become aware of love's desire to manifest its purity in and through your emotional nature. Resonate to that, allowing it to reverberate and unfold throughout the emotional domain of your consciousness. Let's shift the frequency now to that of the etheric domain and the vital domain. As you do, become aware of love's desire to manifest its purity in and through your etheric nature. Resonate to that purity, allowing it to reverberate and unfold throughout the etheric domain of your consciousness. Shift the frequency now to that of your physical body and the physical domain. As you once again experience this rate, become aware of love's desire to manifest its purity in, through, and as your physical body. Resonate to that purity, allow it, allowing its healing power to manifest throughout your body, throughout every cell.
You now become aware of love's desire to manifest its purity through each and every domain of your consciousness, all simultaneously in perfect harmony, resonating to the symphony of your being. And for the time we've had in accessing that support of the infinite, we say thank you. Thank you, thank you, amen. So that's something that came to me many, many years ago and I've been practicing it for a long, long time. Um, just, uh, and it, you know, it continues to make a lot of sense. Thank you so much for sharing that. Did that how, did, how did that work for you, Will? Yeah. It feels good. It feels so yeah. good. And, you know, by the time we got to the unconditional love, it, it was just like, it was like poor outpour of love. Beautiful. Like yeah. yeah. All around me. And uh, it was so nice to have that infused throughout my being as we, as we uh, were transported through the different domains. Yeah. Thank you. So. So I, I want to leave people with this. There are many, many routes to um, 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 to that, you know, spiritual state, to the superior condition, to awareness of the divine, if you will. You know, um, the the, the well, spiritual language is kind of pretty inexact, and probably for a reason. <laughs> but <there> are, <laughs> Um, the, the vagueness has its has its uh, benefits as well because yes, people yeah. don't um, attach to things on a microcosm level when they really need to be on a macrocosm. Yes, yes. So I want to thank any of those people who've been with us. Um, yes, thank we you. Really um, it. You know, because it always makes things better, especially when you're meditating. Um, so um, um, thanks yeah. to all the listeners, yeah. Yes, we appreciate them very much. And we appreciate you sharing so much about how to enter into the super consciousness, especially using Andrew Jackson Davis and that superior mind condition. Mm -hmm. And it really is that super consciousness pathways that we're all on. And I, I wanna let people know that Tom will be teaching. Uh, he's got a... a a workshop he'll be teaching about healing and elementals you said right yeah healing with element that's in august and in july i have a week-long um uh, class in lilydale called uh, healing mastery it's on um basically it's a survey of like, a lot of uh spiritual healing techniques and the things that i've learned through the last 50 years of doing it <laughs> and hopefully within the next month lilydale will have of all of the different workshop events listed up on the website, lilydaleassembly.org. So you can register for classes. Of, I think it'll be by this month or, or March uh, that, we'll, that they'll have that together. And um, did I see you were also teaching something? On, on February 19th, I have a um, on distant healing. Yeah. You know, fundamentals of distant healing. Yeah. So the fundamentals of distant healing, which is something nowadays a lot of people are doing. <laughs> yeah. the, the world of Zoom, as it were. But uh, so I encourage you to take a look at those things. And you probably have information about that on your website as well, right? Tom Um Yes, but it's definitely on the Lilydale website. You'll find that, that all those Lilydale classes, because that's where you have to register. You know, exactly. that's yeah. where you can get your tickets to attend Tom's classes. Beautiful. Yeah. And uh, so for next week, I want to let people know my guest is Brenda Hawkins. We'll be talking about managing emotional overwhelm and she'll be sharing some techniques on the show uh, with all of you to the, the next week, which is uh, Wednesday at 10 a.m. Eastern on my Facebook page, Willa White Medium. Thanks so much for being on the show oh, today, Tom. It was awesome. Oh, can I say one more thing, Willa? Yeah. Sure. Um, one of the things that I want people to know that uh, right now, um, because the program isn't fully out, there um, 
Um, the off, the Lilydale office isn't immediately taking reservations, so give it another month before you, you know, or if, at least a few weeks when all of that is um, compiled and put together in the Lilydale website, um, so that um, um, there will be somebody at the office who can, um, uh, if you're curious and interested in any of the courses, sure. that you can um, you can register. You know, not just mine. The the the, the, the yeah. Lily Deal is going to have a wonderful plethora of uh, of courses on a wide variety of of um, spiritual metaphysical subjects. So yeah, yeah. the the Lily Dale summer season for 2022 will start on June 24th and run for about 10 weeks. And uh, there are daily events, there are weekly events, and there will be workshop presenters of which Tom and uh, many other wonderful people will be here so that you can learn as much as you possibly can from Lily Dale and uh, attend the message services and the healing services as well. Oh, thanks so much, Tom. I hope everyone enjoyed the super consciousness pathway. Bye-bye everyone. So long. <laughs>